Coming up on New Day at Arirang. South Korea is expected to report record levels of COVID-19 infections today when test takers take the Suning National College entrance exams. To prevent further spread, students are required to get their temperatures checked and to wear masks. The UN has unanimously adopted a resolution on North Korean human rights for the 17th consecutive year. The resolution condemns what is called the North's systematic and gross violations of human rights and expresses concerns over continuing reports of violations. And U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman says Washington is very satisfied with its latest consultations with South Korea and Japan on the best way to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Hello and welcome to this Thursday edition of New Day at Arirang. It's 8 a.m. on November 18th here in Seoul, South Korea. Thank you ever so much for being with us. I'm Mark Broom. And I'm Kim Mulgan. Over the next hour, we'll take a look at the big news stories of the day and get expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. We certainly will. So today is a big day. It's the day of South Korea's annual college entrance exam. It's known as the uh, Sunung. Uh, it's finally here. Nearly 510,000 test takers are set to take the make or break exam. Their performance will determine which university they can enter next year. Now, this year marks the second time test takers would take the exams amid the COVID-19 pandemic. For more on this, we have Xin Yen live at one of the test centers. Yen, how is the atmosphere there now? Well, Mugyun, it's not too different from last year when we had Sunung amid the pandemic. We arrived at Seoul High School at around 6.30 a.m. And this is when test takers could enter the premises. And I've noticed the atmosphere is definitely different compared to uh, the pandemic, how it was before the pandemic. I mean, if it weren't for COVID-19, we'd be seeing juniors cheering for their seniors and parents praying outside the gates. This year, most parents dropped their kids off with their cars. One thing that didn't change even with the pandemic was the earnest hope parents and friends had for test takers. I talked to a mother of a high school senior and a friend who came to cheer her friend on. He's worked so hard for this moment, so I hope he's not too anxious and doesn't make any mistakes. I just hope he can finish the exam well. Don't be nervous. Just try your best as usual. Now, yeah, and uh, authorities want this year's Sunung to go as uh, smoothly and safely as possible. Regardless, some students were always going to have the virus at this time. Uh, do we have a number on how many students actually have COVID-19 right now? Yes, up until Tuesday, the Ministry of Education confirmed 68 test takers have actually currently have the virus, and that's higher than last year's number. Um, in 2020, the corresponding number was 35, and the number of those in quarantine this year is also 105. However, these figures may have risen because public health facilities ran COVID-19 tests up till 10 p.m. on Wednesday. But authorities have a backup plan. They have set aside separate test sites, hospitals, and residential treatment centers for any students who need them. They have prepared 463 hospital beds nationwide and 112 test centers for those in quarantine, which can take up to 3,099 test takers if needed. Now, yeah, and apart from securing separate test centers and hospital beds for students, what are some of the other precautionary measures? Uh, well, for starters, the maximum capacity for each classroom has been reduced to 24 people. Test takers must also wear masks at all times. While students are permitted to wear ordinary disposable masks, they are advised to wear government-certified medical masks such as KF94, KF80 or KFAD. One difference from last year is that there will be no partitions between each student's desk. Test takers will only be asked to install paper dividers on their desks for lunch. And authorities explain this is because most have been fully vaccinated. Now, yeah, and, uh, we've been doing, well, I've been doing these kind of reports on the swimming test for many years now. And normally we can't even hear the reporter over the, the screams and shouts of the students behind the reporter. But it's a big difference this time because there aren't many students behind you as you can see. Uh, have they all gone in already or something? Because uh, the test is set to start very soon, correct? Right, you're very right. Students have actually gone in for the most part. And because the test will start very shortly at 8.40 a.m. local time, so we have just over half an hour, and many will wrap up before 5 p 
before 5 p.m., but for those taking a secondary language test, it will go longer. And this is a national exam, meaning the country is rooting for these test takers and showing its support. Uh, aircraft takeoff and landing will be limited for 35 minutes during the listening test in the afternoon. We're expecting most banks to open one hour later at 10 a.m., a gesture to ease any traffic for students heading to test centers. And that's all I have, but I'd like to end off by saying best of luck to all the test takers nationwide. Good luck to you all. Best of luck from us, too. <laughs> yeah, best of luck to everyone. And now turning to the latest on COVID-19 in the country. South Korean health authorities are expecting new infections to hit a new record today. Meanwhile, health authorities have announced steps they plan on taking to provide more breathing room for the healthcare sector. So to break down the latest updates on COVID-19, we have our reporter Kim Yon sung here with us in the studio. Yon sung thank you very much for coming in again. Good morning. A good a place uh, as any to start is the daily COVID-19 tally. As Morgan just mentioned, we are expecting another high number today. Yes, you're absolutely right. So today's figure is actually quite noteworthy because it's the highest late night tally the country has ever seen. South Korean health authorities tracked down almost 3,000 new infections up to 9 p.m. last night. And with the official morning tally usually adding a couple hundred to the 9 p.m. tally, it's likely that total cases will add up to somewhere around 3,300. You know, ever since South Korea eased measures from November 1st to gradually recover a pre-pandemic lifestyle, there has been a visible surge in cases. The capital city of Seoul saw the biggest jump. Infections rose 43% in the two first two weeks of November compared to the first two weeks of October. So, Yeonsung, as we're seeing the increase in the number of um, patients, is there a chance the country would revert back to the strict prevention measures? Right. Before I answer yes or no to that question, I want to mention something that came up in the Wednesday afternoon briefing. So health authorities announced the signs that they were looking out for in order to suspend the easing of measures and pivot to a contingency plan. Take a listen to what they had to say. We're going to comprehensively look at five key indices like operating ICU beds and weekly critical cases, among other data. If the country reaches dangerous levels like the ICU beds fill up to more than 75 percent, we will locate the main reasons behind that and react quickly. They said they were going to look at 17 indices in total and then every week assess where the country stands in a scale of one to five one being very low in terms of danger levels and five being very high. Right now, they say that the nation is at a low or level two, while the capital city is at a medium level. So every four weeks, they're going to compile these assessments and judge if the country needs any changes to the measures before going forward with easing the measures. They have yet to announce what kind of changes they were going to planning to make, but uh, we'll have to look out for future announcements. Right. So it seems rather odd that the uptick in cases in Seoul has been so high and we're seeing a record number of cases around the country, but still officials are saying it's still uh, rather low on this scale. Um, the capital, of course, slightly higher. But does this mean that the current situation as we have it right now is still essentially under control? Yes. Well, let me give you a brief overview of where we stand as of now. So over 80% of Seoul City's ICU beds are full, while more than 60% are occupied nationwide. Even with the majority of the beds occupied, authorities did reassure that the situation is still within manageable levels. And they were going to acquire as many beds as possible to accommodate the growing number of patients. But this process will take several weeks, and even if the number of beds are guaranteed, if there is still a shortage of medical staff, there's really no point. So what health authorities are trying to do now is expanding at-home care and approving COVID oral treatments. Officials have installed a 24-hour hotline that helps to swiftly transport severely ill patients from home to the hospital. And Ministry of Food and Drug Safety is also reviewing the emergency use of the oral COVID pill from Merck. This pill is expected to be a game changer with trials suggesting it has the chances of hospitalization and deaths when taken within five months, uh, excuse me, five days of the onset of symptoms. All right, Yansing, thank you for that report. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you very much, Yansing, for that. Now, uh, South Korea's health authorities have shortened the COVID-19 vaccine interval period between the primary doses, that's the second of the two shots, and booster shots. 
This new measure comes as authorities are increasingly concerned over waning immunity among those who received the jabs in the early days. But will this measure be effective? Choi Won Jung reports. Efforts to restore waning COVID-19 immunity are on the track in South Korea. The country's health authorities have cut the interval between getting fully vaccinated and receiving booster shots from six months to four months for people aged 60 and above or those in high-risk facilities. Those in their 50s are now able to get the extra jab five months after full inoculation. The reason behind the changes? Growing concerns over decreasing antibodies. Due to the Delta variant spreading, multiple breakthrough cases have been reported from nursing homes and high-risk facilities, particularly an increase of severely ill cases and deaths among the elderly. According to health officials, 99 out of 100,000 cases are breakthrough infections, mostly in people aged over 60, which has led to cases of severely illness or death. The question remains, can booster shots restore vaccine efficacy to fight against these breakthrough and critically ill cases? People in Israel have been getting additional jabs amid the rapid spread of Delta variants. Those jabbed with booster shots showed 10 or 20 more vaccine efficacy after 12 days. Other countries have shown similar results. Elsewhere, Hungary and Belgium have begun administering booster shots four months after full vaccination. The UK government are considering to shorten the vaccine interval from six months to five months. However, authorities added that uncertainty remains over whether to give extra booster shots later, based on the future situation in terms of Delta spread. With the following changes, almost 14 million people will be eligible for booster shots by the end of this year. Choi won Jung, Arirang News. Europe accounted for 64 percent of the world's COVID-19 infections over the past week and 57 percent of the fatalities. The WHO says that from November 8th to the 14th, Europe reported over 2.1 million infections and over 28,000 deaths. That's an 8 percent increase in infections on week and a 5 percent uptick in fatalities. The WHO added the Delta variant accounts for almost all infections over the past two months. Yeah, now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. The only topic on most people's minds here in South Korea today is the Sunung, the college entrance exam. We just talked with our Shin ye about. It's set to start very shortly, in around half an hour, in fact, for hundreds of thousands of young test takers hoping to get into the university of their dreams, take uh, the course they want. However, this year, as well as the stress of taking the test, this round of students also has to contend with an increasingly severe fourth wave of COVID-19 in South Korea and for a lot of them, an extended period out of school. Numerous quarantine and safety measures have been put in place to ensure the students are safe, but it's another thing for them and their parents to worry about. For more, we connect to Dr. Alice Tan, internist at Ms. Medi Women's Hospital in Seoul. Good morning, Dr. Tan. Good morning. Well, the antivirus measures will be loosened a touch compared to last year since the students have been vaccinated. C can you tell us what changes are, what are there and um, scientific reasoning behind the modifications? The only two major changes are the elimination of the plexiglass barriers on the desks of the classrooms where the children will be taking the test. And also there will be uh, a requirement for using a KF80 mark or higher mask for all students, uh, including those um, who are asymptomatic. And the rationale behind these two changes uh, was a study that was done in classrooms by the CDC that showed that uh, plexiglass barriers in classrooms can actually impede natural ventilation. And the two factors uh, that really decreased transmission in schools were uh, adequate ventilation and universal masking. So those two uh, factors will be emphasized more. Otherwise, um, hands will be sanitized before entry to the test sites. There will be uh, two-point temperature screenings and also uh, check for symptoms. Anyone who does have a symptom or uh, a temperature above 37.4 will be uh, uh, escorted to a separate test um, room separate from the other students 
uh, this year, uh, as was the case last year. Um, the other difference is during the lunch break, students will be eating lunch at their desks. Uh, there will be no common uh, water um, disposal. Uh, everyone will be helping to bring their own fluids to drink from home. Uh, and also there will be a paper barrier between the desks that is disposable. Um, those are really the only differences. Yeah. Uh, students have been asked to wear extra warm clothes as well because they're going to open the windows every hour to let uh, air ventilate through. So uh, they might be cold as well. But some experts have warned that these te testing centres, even though there are all these safety protocols in place, could potentially give rise to cluster infections given that there are this uh, relatively large number of people crammed under one roof uh, do you share similar concerns? Well, this year, you know, there are actually 90,000 uh, more test takers compared to last year. And of course, this year we're dealing with the Delta variant. The other difference is right now, uh, the demographic of children between the ages of 10 and 19 make up the third highest uh, demographic with incidence of COVID-19 per 100,000 uh, population after people in their 20s and 30s. However, I looked at the epidemiological data after the Sunung test last year, and there were no uh, clusters that were directly linked to the test uh, in the days and weeks after the test. Uh, the bigger risk seems to be uh, what happens after the test. So socializing, partying, uh, that actually you know, will be allowed this year because of the loosened restrictions. Uh, those actually seem to pose a higher risk of COVID spread than the test itself. But Dr. Dan, Dr. Tan, the government says t test takers who test positive for the virus will do it from a hospital or quarantine facility, even if they have no symptoms. How can test supervisors keep a close eye on them if they're not allowed to get near them? Right. Well, this year, as was the case last year, uh, students who are taking the test in a hospital or a quarantine center, they will be monitored by nurses teachers and proctors who will be wearing level D personal protective equipment. And so uh, they will have uh, you know, medical eyes on them as well as the eyes of educators to make sure that they can take the test in a fair and safe manner. And finally, I just want to touch upon something different because uh, many students have been out of school for an extended period. I um, wanted to ask you as a doctor whether you have seen or the, do the, the data supports uh, an increase in the number of teenagers with mental health issues due to the kind of social isolation uh, they've been feeling. Their teenagers are supposed to be hanging around with their friends. Uh, would you say that ensuring uh, these children in their formative years uh, should be allowed to have a normal school life now, even if that leads to a potential uptick in the number of COVID-19 cases? Well, you know, the data regarding behavioral and mental health issues in youth is a little bit difficult to interpret. And the reason why is because uh, starting from 2016, there was actually a steady increase in the diagnosis of behavioral and mental health issues in youth in Korea every year. So 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, there was a steady increase. Then in 2020, there was a decrease in diagnosis, presumably due to decreased access. In 2021, there was a rebound increase and it's uh, assumed that uh, COVID-19 did play a part and the closure of schools, the isolation uh, that occurred. Certainly that has been um, the case in terms of uh, surveys done. Uh, students are reporting more uh, depression, boredom, anxiety due to the isolation that has occurred. Also the economic impact on families has call, caused anxiety among students. So I think uh, the data that are coming out I think these really support vaccination in children to make sure that they can stay in school safely so that they could have as normal a childhood as possible. In terms of the long-term behavioral and mental health impacts of COVID-19, I think this is an area that really needs more research. 
All right, Dr. Tan, thank you for your insights. We appreciate you making time for us, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you for having me. The UN's third committee has adopted a resolution condemning grave human rights violations in North Korea, which will now be put to a vote at the General Assembly session in December. Such a resolution has been adopted each and every year since 2005. Kim here some of the details. The UN has adopted a resolution on North Korean human rights for the 17th consecutive year. Adopted by the UN General Assembly Third Committee on Wednesday, the resolution condemns what it called the North's, quote, systematic and gross violations of human rights. The resolution, adopted unanimously by member states, expressed concerns over continuing reports of human rights violations in North Korea that include torture as well as other cruel treatment or punishment. It also calls for the regime to shut political prison camps and immediately release all political prisoners without conditions. To improve overall human rights conditions, the resolution highlights the importance of engaging in dialogue with Pyongyang, including inter-Korean talks. Moreover, it also urged the regime to resume the reunions of families who have been separated since the Korean War. This year's resolution also notes how the humanitarian situation in the North has been exacerbated by the pandemic, which prompted the closing down of the regime's border. It also calls for the regime to fully cooperate with the COVAX facility as well as other global bodies to ensure the timely delivery and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines for its people. While South Korea did not co-sponsor the resolution for the third consecutive year, it did join the document's adoption by consensus. The resolution will now be put to a vote at the UN General Assembly next month. Kim Hyesun, Arirang News. Now, following a trilateral meeting on Wednesday between senior diplomats from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, Wendy Sherman, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, says they had constructive talks. Her remarks coming despite the fact that her two counterparts were no-shows for a planned press conference. Bayon reports. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman said Wednesday that she had constructive talks with her counterparts from South Korea and Japan. She said the U.S. was very satisfied with the meeting with South Korea's first Vice Foreign Minister Choi jong gon and Japanese Vice Foreign Minister Takeo Mori, adding that she looks forward to further consultations on ensuring the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Asked if the U.S. supports declaring a formal end to the Korean War, she declined to respond saying Washington and its allies are having good consultations and they'll continue to do so. On Sunday, Che said he expected a good result in the not-too-distant future from discussions with the U.S. on South Korea's end-of-war declaration proposal. Sherman also reaffirmed the Biden administration's stance on North Korea, saying Washington harbors no hostile intent toward Pyongyang. She said the U.S. believes diplomacy and dialogue are essential to establishing permanent peace, urging the North to return to the negotiating table. On China, Sherman said freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea was discussed, and the three countries restated their commitment to maintaining a peaceful and stable Indo-Pacific region. Sherman's remarks Wednesday came as, quote, bilateral differences between Seoul and Tokyo led to her two counterparts pulling out of a planned news conference. The three were due to hold a press conference shortly after the three-hour-long meeting, but Sherman addressed reporters alone noting that one of those differences unrelated to today's meeting led to the change. However, she did not elaborate on what the exact issue was. Wednesday's trilateral talks were the first time the three officials had met face-to-face -face in four months. Peunzi, Arirang News. The IAEA's warning that Iran has increased its uranium stockpile just days before scheduled talks in Vienna amid at restoring, aimed at restoring the 2015 nuclear deal. In a report cited by numerous media outlets, including Reuters, the UN's nuclear watchdog said it estimates Iran possesses over 17 kilograms of uranium enriched up to 60 percent, up some 8 kilograms since August. The report comes as the head of the IAEA is slated to visit Iran next week, where he will sit down with the country's new foreign minister as well as Tehran's nuclear chief.
South Korea has been suffering from a shortage of urea water solution in recent weeks. To prevent such situations recurring, the government is rechecking the list of import, temp, import items the country relies on. South Korea is currently dependent on a single country for around 30 percent of these items. At a meeting Wednesday, Finance Minister Hong nam said the government will reform its supply chain management system of roughly 4,000 items so they can be closely monitored. Hong also said that by 2025, around 100 labs will be constructed for R&D of materials the country needs. The urea shortage has been a wake-up call for South Korea. However, experts warn it could just be one of many supply issues that could harm the country, especially when the global supply chain is suffering from bottlenecks all over the place. Kim Sang-min reports. The root cause of the urea shortage was that South Korea had too much of a dependency on imports from a single source. And this aroused concerns as urea is not the only resource that Seoul is dependent on one country for. In fact, there are around 4,000 materials that South Korea depends on a single source for at least 80 percent of its supply. And among them, around half have more than 80 percent dependency on China. That includes magnesium needed for making automobiles and tungsten oxide, essential in chips and medical equipment industries, as well as lithium hydroxide, which is used for making EV batteries. And under the current global supply chain system, where countries are interdependent, resources could be a powerful political weapon. In the recent case of China's coal shortage, the reason why China cut its imports of coal from Australia was because Australia joined the U.S. move to ban China's Huawei 5G networks, believed to be a way to try and suppress its influence. While the decision hurt China too, experts say that the country is taking a long-term perspective. Especially for its neighbors like South Korea or Australia, it is to tear them apart from the U.S. And this is very strategic and it is not a matter of lacking resources at a certain point. It is a very intentional and thorough long-term plan. As a country with scarce resources, experts say that South Korea should diversify import channels as well as monitoring the situation in advance. At the same time, joining economic blocs to gain trustable allies, just like what other countries are doing, is also very important. South Korea is a trade-dependent country, and that's why we have to try to join every single economic bloc that will help us secure important materials, just like Singapore and Mexico. This should not be hindered by political factors and does not matter if the bloc is led by the U.S. or by China. If there are some costs for joining the bloc, we have to keep that in our mind, but still act on it. The expert added that expanding private and public cooperation is needed to help secure the materials crucial for the country's economic security. Kim Sang-min, Arirang News. And now we cross over to our Oseyoung for global insight and an in-depth look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks very much, Morgan. It is indeed time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. As countries continue to roll out vaccinations, some of the world's major tourist hotspots have begun accepting international travellers again and introducing vaccinated, uh, vaccinated travel schemes and quarantine-free travel bubbles. But the coronavirus is proving very difficult to shake off, with nervousness remaining around new variants and reinfection cases. Will recovery and air travel be as simple as just simply loosening the borders? Today we speak with Ian Yeoman, Associate Professor of Tourism Futures at Victoria University of Wellington and co-editor of the Journal of Tourism Futures. We also have joining us again uh, Marion Jopp, Professor of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management at the University of Guelph. Thanks very much for joining us today. And well, let's start with you, Ian, joining us from New Zealand. Now, major Asian travel destinations, uh, including Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam, they've been reopening their borders in recent weeks uh, after some 20 months of restrictions and lockdowns due to the pandemic. And it looks like they'll implement ways to allow vaccinated travel inside their countries. What are some standard requirements or procedures for vaccinated travel bubbles, zones or lanes that we're starting to see? Kia ora. 
um, and welcome from New Zealand. I think the tourism and hospitality sectors going forward face very major challenges because COVID-19 is very much a, a live virus, a live animal. And very much there's this desire to open. So very much countries across the world have come up with restrictions and procedures in order to accept people into our country. We've got to remember many of the countries of Southeast Asia and the Pacific are very highly dependent upon tourism. And international tourism is very important for the economy. So without those tourists, we've seen a substantive drop. So in the in the terms of trying to reopen, many countries have come up with in the terms of number of procedures. And right at the heart of this is about only accepting vaccinated um, passengers. Um, it's about pre-departure tests. We'll probably see um, arrival tests as well with salivia tests. And uh, m- most, of, most airlines across the world are very much focusing on the IATA, the IATA pass, which is basically saying in order to travel, you have to be vaccinated. So some of the, these are some of the basic um, the, the basic requirements which most countries are, are, are introducing before passengers can arrive into their countries. However, with COVID-19, vaccines are fundamentally effective against stopping you going into, into hospital. They, they don't stop the virus. So we're st- still seeing tourists that will arrive into a destination and they will get COVID-19. And there's lots of impl- lots of implications with that. So what we've seen is destinations will open, destinations will close. And the typical one with that was um, when New Zealand had a, a travel bubble with Australia and had operated for 85 days, 76 days of of the, that travel bubble, there was lots of restrictions because of the number of cases that were happening in Australia. So you've got this hesitancy and this opening and closing that's that, that's that's going going on. Well, so Ian, would you say that um, fully vaccinated travel zones or travel bubbles, um, they might not, you know, immediately jumpstart recovery for the travel industry? Then, based on this example, yes, that that's probably the right example because. Uh, those that are traveling first are not fundamentally travelers traveling for the purpose of, of leisure of, of leisure the, the main travelers that are going at the moment are those that are trying to reconnect with friends and family um and, and that type of connections so s- s- destinations have have opened and we have seen resurgence in a number of countries in the terms of traffic if you look at the united states and if you look at europe but fundamentally travel to southeast asia um or intercontinental travel has still got lots lots of boundaries and that what will probably happen now they will open but they will clo- they may close at the same time because the key issue um we, we talk about vaccination is one of the problems is about travel advisories and the other problems is about travel insurance because tra- most travel insurance is not covering COVID 19 in the terms of hospital hosp- hospitalization and it's also not covering in, in the terms of disruption to travel. So it's about the effectiveness of this. That's where, that's why many of the forecasts for the future of tourism are not talking about a, a complete recovery until around 2023, 2024, um, in the terms of levels of confidence, especially in the Asia Pacific area. And well, Marion, to bring you into the conversation, it seems like, well, it's not just about what countries are going to require from incoming tourists, but uh, also pandemic control is something that tourists are going to consider is very important when um, they make their travel decisions because they do want to feel safe uh, wherever they are traveling to. Which countries do you think will be regarded right now as uh, the rather safe zones? Um, what do you think pas- passengers are really going to prioritize when deciding on their travel options? Well, certainly double vaccination. So does your country have a good vaccination rate? Are you doubly vaccinated? Possibly even the booster shot, uh, because we're starting to see, uh, you know, uh, Israel leading the way, but uh, the United States has opened up with uh, booster shots and others are going to follow. So even that may become a criteria. And then you will probably be looking at the infection rate and uh, vaccination rate in the country you wish to 
to visit. And this is where, um, you know, North America and, and Europe and, and uh, a few other countries like Korea have an advantage because of the high vaccination rate in those countries. Um, they also tend to have good uh, health care systems. And so all of those are considerations for, for travelers. Um, and why it is so critical also that vaccines be made available to um, other countries in the world because their tourism will not pick up uh, unless they can see a much higher vaccination rate. And Marion, well, myself included, many people around me, we've been saying, well, at least now we have the option to travel. But when you look at the ticket prices lately, that doesn't really, it doesn't seem to be much of an option there. I mean, you're in Canada right now, and I was actually looking up some um, flight tickets to Toronto and Two months ago, it cost around, um, it was quite cheap back then, it was around maybe $500 uh, back in uh, just a return ticket to Seoul, but now it's somewhere around $2,000. Why are ticket prices just soaring at the moment? Uh, well, it's a combination of reasons. Uh, one is the fact that uh, airlines had to take out a lot of capacity um, and they've been parking uh, airplanes, uh, they've retired a lot of wide-bodied airplanes and similarly had to let a lot of their, their staff go. So now they're bringing them back as demand picks up. But you can't just turn a switch. To bring planes and staff back requires certification. So you have to go through training, you have to go through mechanical processes with the planes to ensure that uh, they, they are up to standard again. So all of that takes time. And we have also seen um, that uh, people are reluctant to go back to work. And so they're also dealing with this shortage of labor. Um, and the way to entice them back is by increasing salaries. Uh, so you take all of that together um, and you see significant increases in prices simply because they, they have to absorb these prices, these costs. Now, Ian, um, as Mary mentioned, many airliners, they've been going, undergoing some uh, problems um, and some were, going, some were undergoing very structural problems even before the pandemic hit. Do you think all businesses are going to be able to recover or do you think there are certain uh, travel sectors that are going to have to adapt to the new normal um, after the pandemic? Without doubt, um, the travel and tourism industry has, has taken a big hit in the terms of disruption because you know international tourism in 20 in 2020 was down around 74 percent globally so the countries that are highly dependent upon tourism just cannot sustain it so you're going to see a smaller tourism industry um over the next two to three years but because the, the demand the demand is not there and because that demand is fundamentally going to be around domestic tourism or within more developed economies, rather than developing economies um, in, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, there's going to be a lot of trouble. So you're going to see a transformation and changes. And fundamentally, you may say the end of tourism in some countries as um, labor forces migrate to, to other industries because um, tourism is not, not sustainable, especially in small island countries where they've previously had this over-dependency on, on tourism so there's there's going to be big big hits and in, in changes going forward and, and a very much a bit, some restructuring and closure of business especially in the next um, two, two to four years because i don't expect full recovery till 2024 2025. Well, Ian, it does seem, though, that the uh, luxury tourism uh, sector, it's managed to weather the storm um, somewhat. They've um, actually been benefiting from the lockdown situation um, as people go on more exclusive forms of travel. What kind of trends do you see continuing? Well, I think the, the, the luxury market is, is, is right at the top. Um, with the luxury market, you can buy isolation. You can buy fundamentally your own, your own bubble. Um, so certain parts of the luxury industry have done very, very well. But even within that, it's, ta it's taken a big hit because tourism fundamentally and its growth over the last 20 years has depended on a, a prosperous middle-class market. 
and that mi prosperous middle class market going forward is going to be squeezed because prices are more expensive and um, inflation is higher so in the terms of purchasing power they just can't they they can't do it so the big trends in in the short term in the terms of tourism will be about uh, visiting friends and relatives uh, and and family tourism become becomes very important we're probably going to see renaissance on your personal bubble and this is probably about rvs and you in control of your own travel you traveling in your own vehicle and doing that the, the growth in tourism from a destination perspective is probably going to be more rural than uh, urban so for example airbnb at the moment is has more holiday is selling more holiday lets in cornwall which is a rural destination than compared to london so we've got this renaissance or mindset about the outdoors and space and and nature the other big thing is covid 19 is very much a dystopian um situation or disruption and when we have that we tend to focus on on hope and kindness and and a new utopia in the future so the big focus across the world at the moment is to regenerate tourism through sustainability through um through products and experiences that are benefits to the community and to the destination so you're going to see more of this sustainability and eco tourism um take off but fundamentally the big strength will be around vfrs and family it's about and it's about space um and your own bubble is the core drivers of the core trends well, so for now, international travel, unless it's necessary or unless it's to see family, for the time being, it does seem like it's still a bit of a hassle. It's also expensive. Marion, how long do you think it's going to take for the industry to recover fully or almost at the full capacity um, back at the levels that it was seeing before the pandemic hit? Yeah, as, as Ian was saying, we're looking at 24, 25 before the, it will be fully recovered. Now, it'll vary by sector and also by market segment. Um, as Ian suggested, the, the visiting friends and relative segment is coming back first, followed by the leisure segment. Business is going to be a bit slower because uh, businesses have realize that a lot of uh, things can be done via you know uh, virtual meetings um, ultimately the the in meeting uh, the in-person meeting will be coming back it's just going to take slower um, as as people sort of reconsider travel options uh, many businesses have cut their travel budgets as well um, because they've, they've had many other costs to cope with. So you're going to see this, this variation um, in terms of what kind of travel and what segments. The domestic, as Ian said, is, is first followed by the um, sort of surrounding countries, uh, regional travel, and then finally, long last, will be the, uh, the intercontinental. Now, from an airline perspective, um, you have to realize that they've always made their money with business travel and intercontinental. Those were sort of the, the huge profit centers. And these are the ones that are coming back slowest for them. So that is also why you're seeing uh, prices go up because they need to compensate uh, for the changed configuration of many of the airplanes where there are few or none that are first class and a reduced number of business seats. Thank you. Well, that was Ian Yeoman, Associate Professor of Tourism Futures at Victoria University of Wellington and Marion Job, Professor of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management at the University of Guelph. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having you. us. Soprano Sumi Jo became the first South Korean to be inducted into the Asian Hall of Fame. Founded in 2004, the Asian Hall of Fame recognizes Asian excellence and cultural unity by honoring, uh, honoring rather, Asian contributions in national and international narratives. Past inductees include Bruce Lee, Connie Chung and Kevin Kwan. 
Joe stands out as the first opera singer and classical music artist to be inducted. Marking her 35-year career, she vowed to carry on for another 35, representing Asia as well as a UNESCO artist for peace. The autumn leaves are slowly losing their lustre, but that's not stopping tourists enjoying and heading to all the scenic spots. One such place is a new hanging bridge. It's in Chungcheongbukdo province, and it's attracting tens of thousands of visitors each and every week. Our Han Sung Yu went to check it out and files this report. Surrounded by the woods of Waraksa National Park in Chungcheongbukdo province lies the Oksumbong Peak Hanging Bridge where people have been relishing the thrill of hanging by a thread since late October. Built without supports to make it shake even more, the 222-meter-long bridge hangs over the majestic Cheongpung Lake, its waters flowing several meters below my feet. The city of Chechen hopes the $7.2 million U.S. dollar project can bring more and more curious tourists to the area as the nation gradually shifts back to pre-pandemic life after nearly two years of antivirus restrictions. COVID forced everyone indoors for so long, but now that we're finally living with the virus, I decided to check the new bridge out with my nephews during our trip to Chetan. About six to 7,000 people came daily during weekdays when the bridge first opened. The weekends attracted 16 to 18,000. Nowadays, the number is around 13,000 a day on the weekends and about 3 to 4,000 during the week. But for those living in the area, the bridge is much more than simply a new landmark. It's a symbolic reunion for Kwegongni villagers who remember when the construction of the Chungju Dam nearly 40 years ago submerged the old land road to the other side of town once forcing them to sail across or drive several kilometers around Cheongpung Lake. Before the bridge was made, it was quite a hassle to visit our neighbors on the other side. We're so happy now that we can more closely communicate with them. For now, visits to the bridge are free of charge, but starting in April, there will be an entrance fee of two and a half dollars, which Chechen City will be using to revitalize the local economy. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News, Chechen. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. India continues to step up efforts to combat high levels of air pollution in its capital as it ordered a ban on non-essential vehicles and a halt to operations at five power stations on Wednesday. The decision to temporarily shut the power stations came from the Federal Environment Ministry, as Wednesday's air quality index was at 386 on a scale of 500, a sign of very poor conditions that threatens those with prolonged exposure with respiratory illness. The New Delhi government banned entry of trucks into the capital city, while planning to hire 1,000 public buses to control pollution from private vehicles. In addition, authorities also announced an extension to the closure of educational institutions as well as remote working for civil servants. While construction and demolition work has been banned until Sunday, educational and government offices will be closed until further notice. One of the world's most polluted capitals, New Delhi continues to battle chronic winter smog annually as falling temperatures trap deadly pollutants from power plants, along with fumes from vehicles and garbage burnt in the open. High repair costs may be a thing of the past for some iPhone users, as Apple announced Wednesday that we will begin the self-service repair program that will give its customers who are comfortable with the idea of completing their own repairs access to Apple parts, tools and manuals. According to Apple's Chief Operating Officer Jeff Williams, the program will start with iPhone 12 and 13, and the scheme will be introduced in phases, adding more repair information and supported devices over time. The first phase of the new program will focus on iPhone's most commonly serviced parts, such as the display, battery, 
and the camera, while other repairs will be available starting next year. The company says repair programs for its computers will be next to join the scheme. The self-service repair program will be done via the company's online store, offering more than 200 individual parts and tools to repair the iPhone 12 and 13. However, the company cautions that the program is intended for individual technicians with the knowledge and experience to repair electronic devices, while calling for the vast majority of customers to visit a professional repair provider with certified technicians for the safest and most reliable way to get a repair. A self-portrait by Mexican artist Frida Kahlo was sold at a Sotheby auction on Tuesday for a record-breaking 34.9 million U.S. dollars, the highest price ever paid for a painting by a Latin American artist. The masterpiece, Diego Yi Yo, or Diego and I, was completed in 1949 and was sold to an unidentified buyer and included a $3.9 million fee. Kahlo spent long periods bedridden after a traffic accident in her youth and attained international fame after her death in 1954 and from the 1970s when she began to rise as a feminist icon. Lee seung Arirang News. Good morning. We normally have a sudden cold snap on Sunung days, but that's not the case this year. Well, there will be light rain in central areas, but other than that, the weather should not be a problem today. Scattered rain is in store for the capital, western Gangwon-do and Chungcheong-bukdo province, but they should let up before late afternoon, but you know, still keep an umbrella handy. Morning temperatures are 2 to 8 degrees Celsius higher than the same time yesterday, but it is still a quite a chilly start to the day. In highs will be 3 to 6 degrees higher than yesterday, so Seoul will be going up to 15 degrees Celsius, Busan and Jeju at 18 degrees, a couple of degrees higher than season norms. Then, wintry precipitation on Sunday and next Monday will bring icy cold conditions to the country from next week. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for now, but we'll be back at 8 a.m. Korea time on Friday for our next edition of New Day at Arirang. We appreciate you tuning in. I'm Kim Mogan. Yes, thank you for joining us. We'll be here uh, on Friday, as Mogan mentioned, and I'll be back at 10 a.m. Korea time with our next newscast. Until next time, goodbye.